There's two things I want to hit before uh, we move on. Um, and they're both on the same page, actually. So the, the sports grants, this is on page yeah. five of the Sunday Independent. So John Green's writing about this. So look, I'll, I'll give broad um, uh, picture stuff. I was, I was reading about this last night just to get on top of the facts and figures. John Green makes a good point on the sports grants. Basically, here's the deal, in short, with the sports grants. We won't spend an hour talking about this, don't worry. So they had planned to give out 30 million. And in the end, they ended up giving out fifty-six million for projects around the country. So these goes to these goes to go to um, all sorts of clubs, authorities who make the application to the government for some funding. Everything from some new jerseys right up to build us a new clubhouse. The maximum you can get is one hundred and fifty thousand. And so uh, there was lots of talk during the week about a Dublin bias and Dublin getting far more than everybody else. I just had a look at it. I'm not so sure that's true. Um, so 56 million of the 26 counties Dublin came out on top inevitably they got 12.76 million in Dublin of the 56 million so I make it 12.6 million of 56 million is 23% of the money and that's for 28% of the population so the Dublin bias thing even though I saw tweets about that I'm not so sure even if you look at it uh, from the GAA clubs as well because John has hived off the GAA stats and the 23.5 million were allocated to GAA clubs and Dublin got 3.3 million of that now I would suspect that Dublin probably has around about maybe a seventh of all of the GAA clubs uh, within the 26 counties at least anyway so yeah, it's probably it's all a, that not not that disproportionate It's, it's certainly got about 38,000 registered players off the top of my head which puts it top of the tree mm. next on that list is Cork with 30,000 um, so anyway Dublin I think does fine it's like 23% of the money for 28% of the population I think we're all okay with that and then um, the big winners, uh, Eno Reardon pointed this out during the week in his piece, which was very good and had all the info. Uh, the big winners were GEA. So GEA got 23 million. The FAI on football got 7 million. And uh, rugby, in rugby country, Declan, rugby got 3 million. Mm. Of Much the, needed. Uh, of, the, of the 56. So that's the broad uh, breakdown. The other big winners, if you're wondering, by the way, tennis got 2.64 million. Uh, golf, interestingly, I thought it was interesting that golf managed to net in two million, considering they're charging heavy enough fees around the country at certain clubs. Sailing got one point two one million, going to thirty six clubs. Rowing got a million. Any big medals will do that to you. Yeah, athletics only got um, nine hundred eighty seven thousand. Like you kind of wonder how much we're supporting our athletics, and then uh, on it goes. Like gymnastics got two hundred seventy thousand between fourteen clubs. Um, so that's the that's the broad picture, I think, on the sports grants. Uh, 56 million. Everybody who had a successful application, and I don't mean successful as in being granted, I mean just not messing up yeah. the forms they and the boxes you're meant to Procedurally did everything properly. Yeah. yeah. Everybody got something. And that's how this thing is mushroomed from 30 million up to 56 million. Hey, there's an election on the way, <laughs> yeah. as we yeah. know. Yeah, well, I was funny. It's, it's funny that John actually makes the point in passing that, uh, you know, gone be the days where this was effectively just a slush fund that was used to try and buy votes come election time. You wonder yeah. what context this would have been cast in if we had been in the middle of an election. If I was to sum up, and Gav, you, you might jump in here because you get a, you have a feel for this stuff. If I was to sum up John Green's uh, core point in the Sunday Independent, the headline is Grant's programme needs fine tuning to target those who are in need most. His point is that if you go, I had a look last night, there is a, there is a lot of upgrading of facilities already there, mm. successful in the applications. His point is, you know, clubs like GAAs, GEA clubs often have a lot of expertise because they have a lot of members who can come in and, and, and put their minds to the application yeah. forms and do very well. So I think his point is some uh, sports and some clubs in particular really know their way around this world and are putting in good applications. And his point is that maybe what we have now is the people with a lot are getting a bit more and yeah. the have-nots aren't. He says, there's ne- a, a rethink now, it's, now needs to be required. Uh, there needs to be greater effort to distinguish between the haves and the have-nots. Some clubs have become expert at putting together strong applications that fit all the criteria and have an excellent track record. Uh, this is particularly true in GEA, which can typically call on expertise from within its ranks to do this uh, simply because they have more members. He says the government needs to draw breath, get a handle on the situation. I think this is a good idea in each mm. county in terms of facilities. So he says, uh, rank all the counties based on need and then use this ranking system as the key determinant in finalising the next round of grants. Yeah, maybe. As, as opposed to who sent in the best yeah, applications. Yeah, and, and maybe actually that's where some of the, the allegations of Dublin bias might hold fruit because evidently Dublin is going to have the best developed sporting infrastructure anyway. So maybe yeah. should they be getting their fair share or should they be getting less than their fair share to address the imbalance everywhere else? Um, I do think it's interesting though, and I mean, uh, it's you could call up anybody who's involved in GAA and even my own club and me <laughs> could, could look at it, different examples from here, there and everywhere of 
needing to pick somebody's brain because you've got a, uh, a you know a challenge against a disciplinary finding coming up or you're applying for a grant or one thing or another. Um, but he does have a very good point that if you just look through it, that if you see, for example, what a lot of GAA clubs are being awarded, um, they're getting funding for uh, all weather facilities, skills walls, clubhouse extensions. So evidently they've already got a clubhouse and yeah. maybe should we still be looking at some of the nomadic clubs that actually don't have facilities of their own or, you know, even Kula are in a Leinster final today and okay, granted they're in a Dalky, one of the wealthier parts of Dublin, but in terms of facilities, you know, they've they've got their pitch and they've got nothing else and if you're trying to build a big hurling nursery or trying to develop any meaningful infrastructure, you need to have a couple of extra pitches and there's simply nowhere else to put them. So there's always this, this kind of difficulty. Um, but clearly there is an unfair advantage that the ones who have are the ones who know how the system works and we all know of the anecdotal stories of people who had good grant applications or very meaningful and worthy scenarios but just don't know how to you know sprinkle the stardust on the application that yeah. it needs to fall over the line uh, and it's it's especially interesting now if we're now discovering that in fact every single application that did that that it wasn't simply a case of here is a finite pot and we'll split it, thin it as best we can, that they simply decided to nearly double the pot because yeah. of the money that's there. Um, one thing it does come back to though, and this is perhaps a, a slight tangent, but um, it's something I'm always struck by whenever I'm in any other countries and obviously Ireland is a different sporting landscape and the GAA has this own particular role. Um, but I think because of the existence of the GAA that we don't have very many uh, like municipal publicly owned multi-sport facilities. Like if you go to any other um, European country you might find a a city or town run sports facility that has full 11 aside pitches and astroturf and five asides and tennis courts and you know badminton and and mm. basketball and all of these things and actually maybe a little bit of me wonders whether instead of supplementing clubs that already have a lot now this could be at the detriment of the clubs who don't have anything and who still deserve the money yeah but then actually should we not be spending something of the 55 million on actually municipally owned things because ultimately the purpose of sport you know if you look at it holistically, is to try and improve fitness yeah. and people's health, yeah. but not necessarily to improve one code I, over another. I agree totally. Like the the one last point, I was going to throw it to you, Declan, not that you're the government. Mm. So what doesn't make sense to me is we have a, a desperate need in this country for walking tracks, for municipally owned centres, for, for towns which have, you know, access to different sports beyond just the big three. Um, we're spending, what, less than a million on athletics here, for instance. Um, why is the GEA, of that 56 million, why is the GEA getting 12 million when all we hear from the GEA is that every cent they make from Sky mm. deals and sponsorship deals mm. is sent out to where? The grassroots. Yeah. So the GEA seems to win on every front here. It's getting by far the biggest amount of money from the government here, mm. way over other sports. And it also has its own massive revenue each year, which, which supposedly is going to grassroots. So well, well, I you, suppose you they kind of think, what's the, going on here? The magic word, I think, in all of these things that you're talking about, who who brings in, puts in the best application is community, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think if you put the word community into anything... It's bonus re- points. Relating to go, uh, yeah. Yeah, oh, they love that, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, um, you know, so uh, the GA can rightly claim to be you know, a huge community organisation. Yeah. And that is, in a way, the magic word, you know. But interestingly, I I wouldn't probably uh, object to that now to the extent that I would have done once because a very odd thing is going on in in aspects of the GA as well. I mean, for example, there's a piece um, today in in the Mail on Sunday by um, Philip Lanigan in which he describes this uh, organisation called Gaelic Voices for Change, right? Uh, one of the main people there is Dermot Ling, mm. you know, former um, uh, foot player. And uh, it's to do with, with homelessness, right? Uh, they're kind of, I suppose, influenced a bit by American sportsmen like Kaepernick and the, you know, that, that sort of sense of sportsmen making a political stand, mm. right? And uh, uh, so what they're on about, they're, saying they're not going to solve homelessness, but they're kind of organising a thing for, I think, the 16th of December, uh, a kind of a sleep out, right? Uh, a lot of GA players are, are involved in it, right? Uh, it's a very progressive sort of thing, right? Just this awareness that they are actually part of something other than just um, uh, playing football or, or hurling. Mm-hmm. Uh, and interestingly, I know from the, a lot of stuff I've done on gambling that uh, in all of Irish society, one of the more progressive, one of the few progressive sort of voices are those uh, in, coming from the GA because they've recognised they have a huge problem with young men gambling uh, and getting into problems with gambling in all sorts of, uh, of ways and they've actually been doing something about it so that interestingly 
in Irish public life, the vast majority of people who've come out and said they've got gambling problems are GAA players. You would think that for some reason GAA players are more prone to gambling than anyone else, but it's not that. It's in fact the fact that the organisations themselves have this kind of progressive approach mm-hmm. whereby famous Gaelic players have come out and said they've uh, had problems, which gives good example to others. And they have this kind of um, uh, structure now mm-hmm. in relation to that. So, um, you know, that's kind of okay, I think. At the same time, when you see something like athletics are getting less than a million, mm. uh, that doesn't seem to make yeah, any sense. Me as odd, yeah. Just as a, yeah. a by the by, though, and we've seen that the GA and, and the GA, you know, it rightfully comes in for some criticism on this, but then what is the, the purpose of the FAI's commercial deals? Where does that surplus money go? Presumably that's meant to be invested in grassroots as well. I mean, the IRFU this week sold the rights to the Autumn Internationals to RTE. We know TV3 is going to have the Six Nations next year. Presumably that's going to swell the IRFU coppers a bit. Uh, fair point. They got I mean, three million in yeah, comparison to presumably twelve. Presumably, every GA. major sporting organisation that has any kind of commercial revenue is intended to divert that towards new facilities mm. or grassroots no, development. It's just you could argue, say in the case FAI, maybe slightly differently, but in, you could argue in the case of the IRFU. Well, most of our money is trying to pay our top guys to stay here at the moment. We mm. got a, we got a big salary here to cover. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And by the then the FAI say, well, what what are we doing that we're allowing uh, League of Ireland clubs to slowly dwindle? Perhaps. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, it is the point still, still though that like you know the, it used to be the case that then um, the GAA was in many ways you know involved with the most backward elements of society. I mean, it's still chilling to see the Artane boys band back in the nineteen sixties playing yeah. for the in the All Ireland final. Uh, you know, knowing yeah. now. Yeah what that represented mm. and uh, you know the literally kissing the bishop's ring and all this this stuff like it was you know absolutely you know this this awful sort of uh, nationalism and everything like that right that so in in fact it has changed hugely mm. in those ways that that it's uh, you know it's it's now actually more or less the opposite you yeah. know what I mean are yeah, there at point. least there are significant elements in it who have turned that around just about 100%. Yeah. So that's very interesting. Just as a, as a slight segue though, and just, I know we, we had it down towards the um, the mixed bag of stuff towards the end if we had time, but just it seems like an opportune time to mention that on page six of the Sunday Times, Paul Rowan has a piece about how um, the PFAI um, usually at this time of year organises training camps and exhibition games for players who are out of contract as a means to keep them fit and keep them in a shop window. Mm-hmm. And the FAI, for all of its financial clout or whatever, um, this year has decided that it's not going to um, donate a venue for those because previously they've always taken place in Abbottstown. And the FAI says that it's because they simply weren't given enough notice. But Paul points out that that's very difficult to reconcile given they always start at this time of year and also given that there tends to be three or four or five sessions running into January and surely the FAI has facilities mm. available at two months' notice and just finds that very difficult. And I think that casts another question over they, the FAI. It's happened for the last eight years. Yeah, that they're clearly a fixed part of the calendar now. And yeah. He, points out some of the, the uh, Electricity League stars who have been the beneficiaries of staying in the shop window before and I suppose it just raises questions as to whether the yeah. PFAI standing up for the women's footballers early in this year or um, siding with the Athlone Town players during what was alleged there. Again, another gambling story. Mm. Um, that whether in fact that's now being held against them and that the sport is the lesser for the result. Yeah, the FAI, Paul Rowan tried to get onto the FAI and said, can you explain this? You've done it for the last eight years. Why aren't you giving them the pitches? And they didn't elaborate in their statement, which was not enough notice. So people can make up their own minds. <clears throat> but um, I must say my first thought, even before I read it in Paul's piece, was, well, the PFAI and the FAI came to blows over the Irish women's team. Mm. I hope this isn't a petty move on the FAI's part, which actually only hurts the players themselves, not not anybody yeah, else. The, really. the ones so. whose actual livelihoods are at stake, yeah, yeah. and that they're having to. So thankfully, other clubs like uh, Dodalk has mentioned as one. I think Bohemians and Shamrock Rovers yeah. have stepped in with facilities to to help them out. 